I'm gonna gonna get us started um, with our conversation this evening. I'm so grateful to to have everyone here, and just wanted to open up with a little bit of of song, of prayer, um, and framing uh, where we are in the Jewish calendar. Why we we chose this week um, to begin this conversation um, with our community, and then I'll introduce our um, wonderful panelists and and turn it over to all of you um, for our conversation. So I'm going to begin with uh, a song in Hebrew, and the words come from our daily prayers in the evening. Um, we, we say these verses every night. Um, it's a prayer we, we say to God, spread over us your shelter of peace, um, your sukkat shlomecha. night we pray these words spread over us God your shelter of peace because we um, especially in the night we feel our vulnerability and this festival that we're in the festival of, of Sukkot is named for these uh, temporary shelters called Sukkot the Sukkah for a whole week of the year we build temporary dwellings um, those of us who, who have a, uh, the blessing of having a more permanent dwelling, and we do everything we can in those temporary dwellings. Um, and so this festival comes from, uh, we, we get instructions for this festival in, in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus, and God says we should observe this festival for seven days, um, beginning with the full moon of the seventh month of the year. And we should do this in order that future generations may know that I caused the Israelite people to dwell in Sukkot, to dwell in booths or temporary shelters when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So this festival is a reminder of that time of vulnerability after leaving um, uh, enslavement in Egypt and that time of being in the uncertainty of the wilderness, God gave us a miracle and gave us shelter. And our rabbis in the Talmud, they debate, uh, what, is, what exactly is a sukkah? You know, what is referred to in this passage? Is it an actual physical material sukkah shelter? Or a, um, as, as some of our rabbis say um, in the tradition of a rabbi named Rabbi Eliezer and another rabbi, Rabbi Akiva says, no, the, the sukkot referred to the clouds of glory they refer to the divine presence that God enveloped us and embraced us and gave us shelter with God's presence. Um, and I like to think that on this festival, we're remembering both of those things, right? And we always um, need both of those things, the, the material uh, structures um, that help us to, to survive. <laughs> um, and we also need the, the um, spiritual structures that, that are, are life-giving and life-affirming. Um, and so tonight we are so grateful um, to, to have with us um, people from our community who are working 
towards housing justice, who are working to support those who are experiencing homelessness, um, some of you who have experienced homelessness, who are survivors. And uh, we are, are so privileged to, to be with you and grateful to have you here to hear your stories, to learn about what's happening at this moment in our city of Philadelphia and to think together about some ways that we can take action. Uh, most recently on the, the holiday of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, we read the words of the prophet Isaiah, right? It's a day um, in the Jewish calendar where we fast and we um, abstain from food and drink. And we also read the words of the prophet Isaiah who, who says, wait a minute, is this really the fast I desire to to starve your bodies. No, actually what I desire from you is that you will share your bread with the hungry, that you will take those who are, are poor and without homes into your homes. When you see those who are naked, that you will clothe them, um, that you will not be indifferent to the suffering of those around you. So we're also holding those, those words of Isaiah um, and thinking about how it is that, that we might um, respond to this call. Um, to, to help um, give shelter to those who are in, in need of shelter. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our incredible panelists who we have here with us tonight and then give them a chance as well to share their own stories. Um, so uh, I'm Rabbi Annie Lewis, uh, Associate Rabbi at Temple Beth Zion, Beth Israel. Here as well is uh, our Senior Rabbi, Rabbi Abe Friedman and other representatives of our community um, Ivy Weingram uh, from our board of directors who helped us to put together this panel this evening. And um, on our panel, uh, one of our community members, uh, Shoshana Bannett, um, who oops, um, has uh, been the director of real estate development for the, the Federation housing of our, our Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia since 2016. Um, and Shoshana works on identifying potential development opportunities and also financing to create housing for low-income seniors in our city. Um, and she has uh, helped to secure over $150 million for affordable housing across the Commonwealth. Um, she received her BA from Brandeis University and her MA from the University of Pennsylvania where she was awarded the Chester Rapkin Award for excellent work in housing, community, and economic development. Um, so we are so grateful, Shoshana, to get to, to learn from you with your um, professional uh, hat on. So we are happy you are here. Um, we have representing Project Home um, to, to panelists, Nicole Still. And Nicole grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and currently resides in Philadelphia. Um, she has an associate's degree in behavioral health and human services. Um, she's certified as a peer specialist in the state of Pennsylvania. And um, she's a mother to a multi-poo fur baby by the name of Benji, um, a rescue uh, four years ago. Nicole works as a residential services coordinator at Connolly House for Project Home. She provides residents with resources to connect them with support um, to maintain an independent quality of life. And she is a survivor of, of many things, of bullying as a child of domestic violence and addiction. And she now provides those services to others as a way to pay it forward. Um, so Nicole is here representing Project Home along with Martin Wiley um, from Project Home. Martin is the service learning program coordinator and he works with schools and student groups and individual youth and various organizations to provide learning experiences that help students have a better understanding and awareness of issues of homelessness and poverty. Um, and he helps students find a way to, to make a difference. He's been at Project Home for over two years and during the current pandemic has been uh, working with Vote for Homes in order to register to vote. Um, those people who are experiencing homelessness and, and poverty. Um, so that's our, our Project Home representatives. We have also representing the Welcome Church, uh, which is a congregation 
um, under the development of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, a congregation that's made up predominantly of people who are experiencing chronic street homelessness in Philadelphia. And so we're grateful to welcome, uh, Rabbi Abe and I are grateful to welcome our colleague, uh, Reverend Chanel Steinigal. And Chanel is a, a minister of word and sacrament in the Presbyterian Church, um, working in wonderful ecumenical partnership. Chanel attended Middlebury College and Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York. And Rabbi Abe and I have been um, grateful to, to be uh, part of our neighborhood clergy association uh, and to get to connect with Chanel um, there as well. And also representing the Welcome Church is Jackie Chapman. Um, Jackie was born in Philadelphia and moved out on her own at age 18 uh, when she started a family. She began experiencing homelessness between 1991 and 1996. Uh, she struggled with addiction and was back on the streets from 2006 to 2013. And she's now an active uh, community member of, of the Welcome Church, helping to weave community for others. So we are so honored to have you all here. So I'm going to um, turn it over to our speakers and want to invite our speakers, if you'd like to share how you came to be passionate about issues of, of housing justice um, and a bit about your story. Um, and also, if you'd like to share uh, anything about the focus of your current work in, in our city. Um, so I want to start uh, with our um, representatives from Project Home. Um, so Nicole and then Martin, and then we'll hear from Jackie and Chanel, and then we'll hear from Shoshana. So we'll begin with you, Nicole. <laughs> okay, well, um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Nicole Still, and um, I will give you a little bit of my story. Um, as you all heard in, in, in the introduction, that um, I am a survivor of domestic violence and addiction, and um, most recently um, in my life, um, I have experienced homelessness, and um, that is something that I never thought I would experience. I never even considered it, but when it happened, um, it just showed me a whole different side of life. And um, how I uh, was introduced to Project Home was um, from many years of active addiction that progressively got worse um, that I finally, uh, I got this gift called desperation and, and I was just desperate to do something different and live, live a different way. And, and I like checked myself into a recovery house and, and then I went through the process of um, signing up with the Office, office of Homeless Services um, and uh, eventually uh, I got word of a place called Project Home and um, I stood in line and I put in an application for housing, affordable housing, and, and I went through the process and I got a resident. I got a I got a, a beautiful uh, studio apartment um, in Center City that I can afford. And um, Project Home has been uh, very supportive in my journey. Um, and because of the active addiction, um, I, I hadn't worked for a very long time. And they gave me a chance, and and I applied for a job as a as a on call receptionist, and um, that's how I started back to work. And and um, they continued to uh, give me more hours, and and then um, you know I would apply for part time work, and then full time work, and then uh, I finished uh, my degree and. Applied for a community health worker at um, Stephen Klein Wellness Center, which is uh, Project Home FQHC. And um, then after that, I applied for a residential services coordinator. Um, because I have lived experience, um, I feel led to, to help others find their way out. Um, 
and um, what I'm, I'm learning so much um, and what I experience um, in, in my day-to-day -day job um, is that the people that actually, because each site is different, um, the site I live in is, is funded differently than, than Connolly House and um, they're, they're actually referred, uh, the residents that live at Connolly House are referred from the Office of Homeless Services directly and um, a lot of people, well actually a lot of the residents have lived there for a very long time since it opened up, um, so they're very like far removed from chronic homelessness now because we've been there 10, 11 years. Uh, but the people that are new, some of the people are, are coming, like I can think of one person right now that are from the straight off the streets from chronic homelessness, like 15 years of chronic, chronic homelessness. And it's an adjustment and it takes a lot of time. And, and you know, but we just continue to support and, and you know, um, be there to show them uh, a new way of life. And I believe, um, that eventually things work themselves out, you know. Um, just because I know that's been my experience um, with the support that I got, it helped me to to grow into the person that I probably have been running away from for most of my life. Um, so um, I just um, I kind of I kind of jumped to the end first, and um, you know just to to backtrack and give you a little bit about uh, the reason for the active addiction was um, I grew up, um, as you heard, like in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and I grew up in a place where no one really looked like me, and, and I was born with a bad eye, and I was bullied severely, and I didn't know how to cope with those emotions, and um, I, I turned to, to drugs and, and I had a long battle with addiction, um, which eventually over the years um, had led me to homelessness. Um, so uh, I, I wish I could uh, give you more. I'm just trying to think what else I could give you. Um, I do want to say um, that it, I'm I'm glad that Project Home is touching the lives um, of so many people and, and that people feel led to support because the work that we do at Project Home um, that they have been doing um, is, is just life changing for a lot of people. And uh, there's so many different levels of homelessness and like there's homeless people that are chronically homeless that they have master's degrees. Like some of the residents that I serve right now have master's degrees. Like, they, you know, it, it could happen to anyone. And, you know, um, and, I, and I'll, I'll be the first to say, you know, I always thought like that the homeless person sleeping on the, on the uh, ground outside, you know, it's just crazy to, to put a bad, you know, just to, to just to be honest, but it's not that it's the trauma, you know, um, that people experience and without the, with the lack of support, you know, um, can land people out there. Um, you know, I never slept on the street or anything like that, but I was homeless. I had nowhere to go. Um, I, I had no place to call my own with no key or door and, um, and I survived. I, and, um, you know, so, and, and what I also do is I, I participate in my recovery and I, I, I stay vigilant about staying clean a day at a time so I don't ever have to return to that because I know what that leads me to. So now I'm actually learning a new way of life and I, um, I really enjoy being able to share it with others to let someone know that's been in my shoes or, or walking down that path that there's a way out. Um, and that gives me purpose. So um, I hope I, I talked enough. Um, I really thank you all for listening. <laughs> thank you so much, Nicole, for sharing a bit of your story with us. Yeah, we're, and we're, oh. we're so grateful you're here and, and we'll 
um, get a chance to hear hear more from you in a bit as well. I'm gonna um, turn it over now to uh, Martin, who's also representing um, Project Home. Hello, good evening. Um, so uh, it's funny, like when you uh, try to look back at things, um, when you get enough distance and age, I guess you can look back and say, oh, it totally makes sense. It was an easy, clear, straight path, but um, it definitely did not feel that while I was living it. Um, but the easiest answer uh, for how I wound up here is that I am a poet. Um, and I started writing poetry and very early on, uh, a lot of poets, um, some who are fairly big names in poetry, others who no one would ever hear of, but who were more experienced than I, um, would sit me down and look at my poetry and spend hours for no reason just to help help someone out. Um, and they kind of instilled in me the belief that that's what you did, was that you um, helped the next generation. Um, and from that, I you know, stumbled into being a community organizer and from that into teaching. Um, and I was teaching community college uh, and the person who has the position I have now had a, a new, uh, had a job offer that they wanted to take. And this was, uh, we do a summer program every year where we bring students in and give them, uh, it's essentially like summer camp for uh, people who are interested in community service. Um, community service summer camp, which is actually a lot more fun than it might sound just as the name. Um, that would be a bad title. Um, but we, uh, they needed somebody to jump in and because I was already teaching, I had all my things, so I jumped in. Um, and very quickly, I loved it, and I loved the place. And uh, as we decided what to do with the position, um, I was very clear that I wanted to do something that was beyond just service, just having students come in and do something nice and leave, but rather uh, to push people towards social justice and social change. Um, and that was what the organization wanted. Um, and we're very aware that my position really is to create like the next generation of social justice activists, whether they decide to work around issues of homelessness and poverty, great. If they decide that their passion is something else, but they take the things that they learn from us and the ways of looking at the world from us and move it on to something else that the world benefits. Um, and what gives me the most passion, uh, what, what makes me, you know, excited um, about my job, um, which is a very strange thing to, to say, like, I will be honest and say that I've had many jobs that I liked, but I've never had one before this that I was like excited to go to work. Um, but what makes me excited is when I work with young people, especially young people who are unaware of what privileges they may have and are unaware of uh, some of the sometimes very horrific realities of other people's lives, um, that when they become aware of that to, instead of letting it be something that you know, shatters them or makes them feel guilty or uh, they want to just do something nice to help, but rather to have them, to see them build within themselves a true understanding of what social justice is and what it is to uh, help heal the world and help, you know, be in community with others. Um, that's the greatest feeling that I can imagine. And that is me doing the best that I can to pass on the way those poets many years ago did for me. Well, it feels like many years to me. Um, to pass it on and to take what I know and bring it to others. So that's why I do what I do. Thank you so much, Martin. Sure. Um, we're gonna hear from our friends from the Welcome Church, um, Reverend uh, Chanel Steinigal and Jackie Chapman. Um, Reverend Chanel, you wanna start, start us out? Oh, there we go. All right. Um, I think I've just always had a, or for a very long time, had a desire to um, reach out to and mend gaps with people who are the most, who are, for a whole wide range of reasons are sort of the most shut out or distant or looked down upon. I mean, trying to piece, piece the pieces together of what brought me there. I think obviously I went to seminary in New York City, um, which is, uh, I was sort of, you know, talking about this with my husband last night and saying, you know, homelessness is very in your face in New York City. And then we were kind of laughing that everything's in your face in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, then I, but then I was ordained actually to working at a homeless shelter in Cecil County, Maryland called Meeting Ground. And then the job I had after that was working 
as the hunger action enabler for the Presbyterian of Philadelphia, which I did for like 11 years. And then um, when that sort of came to an end, I had already gotten to know um, Violet Little, who is my colleague in the Welcome Church, who was a Lutheran pastor who founded the Welcome Church. And um, so I was sort of doing either, you know, on the side, either as a volunteer or on, as on the side with my job with the Presbyterian, a lot of things with the Welcome Church. So it was very much a natural transition to step in and um, take on a formal position with the Welcome Church. So that's been since 2013. Um, the focus, I would definitely describe it as um, building community and make, creating relationships with people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and, uh, and in that, um, recognizing that everybody has both needs and gifts and um, helping people to know that, you know, that sometimes you know, people um, need to hear that they have gifts because they've never heard that before. And when they hear that, they might be able to think a little further and think what those are, but helping people to realize that. And um, also just uh, providing a presence and uh, a pastoral presence with people who are on the streets, which is, I would think, something sort of unique that we do. We definitely sort of, at least in an, <laughs> a number of, up until a number of months ago, we definitely had food every time we got together with people because that's a very natural thing to do for everybody to do. But the emphasis on getting together with people and then having that we have food together growing out of that. Um, so providing, as, as opposed to being a food program or whatever. So um, the emphasis on building community and um, providing pastoral presence with people who are experiencing homelessness in Philadelphia. Thank you for sharing um, that. And it's really powerful thinking about um, this framing that everybody has needs and everybody has gifts. And we're going to hear now from Jackie Chapman uh, a little bit about your, your story. So hang on one second, Jackie. Can you um, unmute yourself so we could hear you? Can you, can can you, you hear me? Yep. Uh -oh. Good evening, everyone. Um, I started experiencing homelessness between 91 96 i had my own apartment then i lost that apartment because my addiction kicked in again then um i lived on the street i slept in front of city hall love park different places people would let me stay and then put me out then i ended up in the um safe haven and did all my paperwork, stayed there until I got my apartment I have now, which I've been here for eight years. Um, I came across the Welcome Church like in 2010, I, and I found support there. Um, I learned how to knit. Today I knit scarves and trying to sell them. Um, I give, I try to give back as much as I can um, because it's, I, I think it's, that's the way God wants us to be is to reach back and don't forget where you came from. So I try to stay in touch with where I was and talk to people. Um, I work for the Philadelphia Unemployment Project. There I could communicate with a lot of homeless people I would share my knowledge. I would share my experience out on the street, hoping that I would be helping someone. Um, so today I sit on three different boards. I sit on um, Philadelphia Unemployment Project Board, um, Sanctuary Village, Tiny Houses, trying to um, do work on helping people to come on, come in off the street, think about how to get the property and start building tiny houses to put people in. 
and then I sit on the board of HAP that help the homeless with legal, um, any legal issues they have. So they have a board and they um, invited me in to sit on the board of that. So today um, I did a training. I got hired on a job today um, to get out and canvas to get people out to vote. Now that's one of my passions I like to do too because I did it with the Philadelphia, because I used to work for the Philadelphia School Board. I didn't put that down there. I did work for them. So from there I went to the union and when I um, got with the union, I started making phone calls around election time, um, going out canvassing, talking to different people and I like doing that. So now I'm getting ready to do that again, but in a total different way. I'm experiencing a new way. It's no more with the clipboard and the ink pen and paper. Everything is done with your smartphone. So that's exciting to learn. So um, I take one day at a time and um, I'm just thankful to be where I'm at. That's it. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us and for sharing your story with us and your, your wisdom. Um, we are going to hear now from Shoshana Bannett. Um. Hi. So thank you so much for having me, Ivy, Rabbi Annie. I know Rebecca Krasner was also involved, so thank you. And thanks to the other speakers. It's been really um, so inspiring to hear everybody's stories. Um, I do a lot of work with spreadsheets and not as much forward facing with the people. So it's been really interesting to me to hear the other side of sort of the housing and homelessness um, world where people are interacting with people. Um, I do the real estate development for Federation Housing. We're a nonprofit organization that was founded by the Jewish Federation in Philadelphia, but we are our own um, 501c3 nonprofit. Um, I was hired in 2016. Um, they hadn't had a, a, develop, a real estate development um, person before, and I was hired to sort of develop a strategic plan and help Federation Housing figure out more sites to, to buy and develop into affordable housing. Um, Federation Housing's a, a developer, a property manager and a supportive services provider for, for low income seniors. Um, we have 1,260 units across 11 properties. We serve 1,500 seniors. We have buildings in Philadelphia, Montgomery and Bucks counties. Um, and among many of the services that we provide, we provide housing, we provide free transportation, low cost meals, chaplaincy, case management, and we partner with a lot of other nonprofits in the area, um, Golden Slipper, Abramson, um, to, to bring uh, visiting nurses, recreation programming to our residents. Um, I came to Federation Housing, I grew up in the Bay Area, um, and I think Chanel, Reverend Chanel was just saying about New York, I was also very aware in the Bay Area of the, um, the extremely high housing prices and the very extreme um, growing homelessness um, that I was seeing growing up. I also, I went to Jewish day school and um, we learned a lot. And actually I had written down the um, quote from Isaiah that Rabbi Annie brought up before, because that was something we really learned growing up in, in day school about sort of um, the, the ways in which we can show compassion from our faith and apply it to very important issues in our community. So after day school, I went to um, college and graduate school and I was pretty uh, sure I wanted to do um, work in affordable housing. Um, so I, I, I did that. I then graduated um, with a master's in city planning and I worked as a consultant for nonprofits and the, in Pennsylvania, doing afford, helping them build affordable housing before I went to um, Federation Housing. Um, and at Federation Housing, we've really developed our pipeline. We have a bunch of projects in the works. In fact, last month we 
won um, $12 million in competitive funding from the state to build um, 54 units of senior housing in Willow Grove in Montgomery County. So um, that's my story. Thank you, Susanna. <laughs> yeah. And um, while, while we have you on the line, Susanna, I'm going to open up the next question. We're going to start with you. So the next um, topic we're going to talk about um, from each of our panelists what would you like fellow Philadelphians to know or understand about issues of housing and homelessness in our city? Um, what would you like, what do you wish everyone in our city knew or understood about homelessness and housing and um, along those lines as well? What are the biggest challenges you're currently facing um, either in your work and your life as uh, pertains to housing and, and homelessness? So what do you wish people understood um, in our city about housing and homelessness. What are the biggest challenges you're facing? So I wrote some of them down because um, there's a bunch. But um, mm -hmm. so from my work at Federation Housing and also as um, in my consulting job before then, um, in every single instance, I saw that there was the demand for affordable housing is so much greater than the supply of affordable housing. Um, and I think that's a national problem. Um, F Federation Housing, for example, um, has had to close every single waiting list of all of our properties because the list became so long that people who called and were placed on the list were on the list for years and years. So um, we, we've, we've closed our waiting list so that people don't have false hope. I mean, now if, if someone calls today, um, they, if a waiting list is open, it's two plus years for somebody to, to get housing at Federation, House, at Federation Housing. Um, when, we open, when we build our project in Willow Grove that I just discussed and we open the, we accept applications, I, I mean, we could probably fill the entire building in one day that the demand is so, so great. Um, and um, so what some of the reasons for that um, are that it takes so much money and so much time and it's a very specialized industry um, and it's complicated and it takes, there's just so many obstacles to build affordable housing. There's the not in my backyard, NIMBY, um, neighborhood opposition that we face, political opposition, um, there's just not enough money, period. Uh, construction costs go up constantly. Um, right now with tariffs and some of the things you've heard about on the news, like lumber prices are very, very expensive. And so you may have thought you could build your affordable housing development and now you find that you can't afford the wood to build it. Um, so there's just uh, a lot of um, challenges with, um, actually building the affordable housing um, and, and the demand is just so strong. Um, our board, I'm sorry, I'll just finish. Our, our board um, continues to come up at Federation Housing with innovative ways to address this staggering need. Federation, the Federation Housing developed a subsidy program that we are rolling out to help pay the rents of some low-income Holocaust survivors living in Philadelphia. We are looking at other opportunities to subsidize seniors in their homes because we don't have homes that we can give people. Um, and we're looking at just buying land and holding it so that we can, um, when the money comes online and there's money available, we can build very quickly. Um, but it's that those would be the biggest challenges that I see in my work. Thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Shoshana, um, Jackie, Chanel, would you like to, to speak to this question? What do you wish um, fellow Philadelphians understood about housing, homelessness? What are you, the biggest challenges you're facing right now? Well, I, um, our biggest challenge is what we're facing is um, getting property to build the town tiny houses on to help with homelessness. Um, from, uh, from what I see, every time you see a, a piece of property, the investors have it. Um, it's a lot of investors in the city 
that holds on to the property until they figure out what to do with it. But they're not investing in the community to keep the people in the community. They're like, um, really the rent, either the rent um, take you out, the, uh, out your community or the gentrification does, either one. Yeah, uh, uh, and we do need more affordable housing, which PHA used to be building these houses, but you don't hardly see them building anymore. You know, um, then you have, we have mental issues, a lot of mental issues here in the, in the city of Philadelphia. And what I experienced um, being in the shelters in and out and, and um, trying to get myself together, what I observed is you can take people off the street and put them in places, but I've have actually seen people put in places brand new furniture and everything, but if they don't have the mentality to be responsible, then it's just a waste of money. So really you would have to take the people, you have to train them all, it's because they're like, you know, they're not that responsible mentally to go into places and just start paying their rent, you know? And, and taking care of things like they should be. So I think really they should deal with the mental issues first, train the people first on how to maintain the property and then put them into uh, a place to live because you put them in and some of them, I've, I've seen it, some of them go in these apartments or in a house and three months later, they back out on the street. So it's it's uh you got to deal with the mental issues and 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 show them how to live all over again, because it's so easy to be irresponsible out living out on the street, but you don't have to be responsible paying rent, electric, gas, you know, purchasing food for yourself. So that's what I've I've observed. Thank you. Um, so now? So I would obviously definitely repeat again the word insufficient affordable housing, which we've heard mm -hmm. twice already, and I'm sure we might hear a couple more times before we end. Um, I'll just underline the um, other problem that people are often dealing with if they're experiencing homelessness, which is that relationships, a lot of relationships are falling apart. A lot of um, people do build community among themselves on the streets and, and create you know, networks and friendships and all sorts of things that help people to survive. Um, but a lot of uh, traditional networks and relationships may have fallen apart with like family or even like mental health services and things. And those breaks in relationships um, at the very least compound homelessness if don't help to, to bring it about. Um, our, our, you know, I would just, for the sake of saying it, one of our biggest challenges right now, as far as what the Welcome Church has always done, is, the, is physical separation. And most people we know don't have access to internet and computers and um, Wi-Fi and different things like that to be able to Zoom with us. So um, we, we're sort of experimenting a little bit trying to get into that kind of thing, but it just obviously, it's only some people we know who have access to that and other people are completely, again, there's a whole world they're shut out of. So um, physical distance and you know, physical separation are, and, and, and are, are big right now. And what goes right alongside of that obviously is physical safety that, um, if you, if you sit, tell everybody there's a pandemic and the safest thing for everyone to do is stay home in their house, there's a whole segment of society that doesn't have a house to stay home in. And I will say the city of Philadelphia did a wonderful job. To, you know, I will give compliments where they do in the spring to um, create additional sites where food could be obtained by all kinds of people who either had up until that point needed places to go eat or who newly needed places to go eat 
but at the same time, those all involve going and getting in a line somewhere, um, which is hard to describe as social distancing. So that's a whole other, um, you know, very frustrating part of our current situation. Um, I, uh, to uh, echo some of the things Jackie was talking about, we are both working on trying, uh, trying to get a community of tiny houses built in Philadelphia um, and looking for property for that. And we're, but at the same time, we're always in, in additionally, uh, the Welcome Church is always trying to sort of ask the question of what does the society look like? It makes space for everyone, even if um, it's not, even if there's people who, because where they're at in their lives, they're not able to live inside a house so in a traditional sense for some kind of reason, how do we have a co community that creates space for that person, that that person can be safe and have their basic needs met um, and, and, and to have re healthy relationships until such a time that it does make sense for that person to be inside somewhere, um, which is obviously you know, means a lot of different things for a lot of different people, but, but just trying to keep doors open in that way. Thank you, um, Nicole and Martin. We'll turn it over to you. What, what would you like us to know or understand about issues of housing and homelessness in our city? What are the biggest challenges you're facing right now? I, I would have to say, um, I agree with what Jacqueline was saying, um, there seems to be a missing piece from someone who has lived so very long on the street. And then when they do get picked for independent living in supportive housing, it's hard to make that adjustment. And they're, they're not used to just taking care of themselves in their home and um, the responsibilities um, and the needs to be that, that piece to help them, that transition piece um, where they can make a smoother transition and, and not like get the housing and then lose it because they're just so far removed from you know, the everyday. Um, my biggest shock in learning um, about homelessness is that there are a small percentage of people that want to live on the street. It's hard to believe, but some people prefer to be free. And, and that's where we just have to support them and being out there in, the, in an unsafe environment. Um, and, and then also, I think it's just bigger than putting someone under a roof. I think it has to do with education and employment because um, like, right, I've always been that person because of, you know, my challenges in life, you know, I didn't go straight to college and I was able to get okay jobs, but not a job where I could totally like have a car and a house at the same time, you know, it was always struggling to just pay the rent and, you know, not quite in, um, in poverty, but not enough to where I could like save up and take a vacation. And, and now that, and this is the first time in my life I've experienced affordable housing, right? And, and you know, um, I was able to go back to work and, and I've incomed out of affordable housing. And to be honest, I've incomed out of affordable housing, but I really can't afford to pay a thousand dollars a month in rent. So I'm actually in a first time home buyer program. So I'm looking to buy a home because it's actually cheaper to buy a home than it is to rent. So, I mean, it's kind of good, <laughs> you know, but um, there's that piece of it, you know, um, with people just being able to, to afford housing that's not in poverty because you, ha you really have to be under a certain income to have affordable housing. So that whole situation is so large i don't even know where to begin but there's a lot of people stuck in that area you know it really is so it's just my I'm so glad for you yeah. no thank you it's important to, to lift that up <laughs> for sure um martin sure um 
when I, when I talk with the students and young people, one of the first things I, I'll do is I'll ask them uh, for a show of hands, um, whether they think Philadelphia is a rich city, a middle-class city or a poor city. Um, and a few will raise for rich, but almost all of them will raise their hand saying it's a middle-class city. Um, and the truth is, is that Philadelphia is a poor city. Um, we can call Philadelphia either, either the largest of the poor cities or the poorest of the big cities. Um, Philadelphia has a 27% poverty rate, um, meaning that 27% of the people in Philadelphia do not make enough money for their basic needs to be met. To me, that is the number one issue that we are facing. Um, when we talk about affordable housing, um, the concept of affordable would vastly change if people had more money. Um, in Philadelphia, the average rent is uh, about $1,200 a month. Now, this is the average. It's different in, in depending on where you are, but the average for the city is about $1,200 a month for a one-bedroom apartment, um, which means that it's over $14,000 a year. Um, the poverty line for two individuals uh, is a little under $15,000, right? So we're talking about like the amount that the government says you should be able to live on for two people um, is about what it costs to have a one bedroom apartment in Philadelphia. Um, if someone is working full time at minimum wage, right, 725 an hour, um, they're making around $17,000 a year, meaning that their rent for a one bedroom apartment, again, that's the average, but for the average one bedroom apartment in Philadelphia, eats up almost their entire, the entire amount of money they make, right? Um, and so when we are, are talking about homelessness, it's not just the people who are experiencing homelessness, it's the fact that so many people in Philadelphia um, are just about to experience homelessness. They're, they are a, a, a missed paycheck. They are a coronavirus. They are uh, a, an illness, a, a broken bone, um, a flat tire away from experiencing homelessness. Um, and so the number one, and my, this is my opinion, I don't necessarily speak for anyone else, um, but the number one thing we need to do is make sure that people make more money. Um, and if we did that, uh, so many other issues and so many other problems would be, uh, I wouldn't say would be dealt with, but we'd be able to deal with them. You can't um, deal with uh, getting therapy for issues that you have if you're hustling, just trying to make a buck. You can't deal with health issues if you don't have health care, if you don't have money. You can't um, take that second and have patience with your children. I, I, I have kids. I know how hard it can be to be a parent or whatever. And if you're dealing with all the added stress of money and all these things, all, they all add on to each other. Um, so to me, the number one thing we have to do is uh, make it so that people in Philadelphia make more money. So thank you all for giving us insight um, into the different challenges that, that you're facing, that we're in your work, in your lives, that we're facing as a city right now. Um, and so we're, we're eager to hear from you about some ways that we may be able to take action. Um, what do you see as, as ways we can take action for housing justice uh, to, and to support those who are experiencing homelessness? Um, Martin, we can uh, come back to you. And then um, folks, you know, if, if you wanna um, chime in as, as you think of something, that's great too. Um Sure, I actually am gonna highlight something that you just said. Um, uh, I'm, as a, I said, I'm a, I'm a poet, language matters. I believe in language. Um, and when I, again, when I talk with students, uh, one of the things I'll say to them is that, you know, if they get nothing else from, from discussing with me, um, if they understand the change in language from saying a homeless person to a person experiencing homelessness, right? And if we stop thinking of it as, uh, oh, the homeless are, are sleeping out there. Rather, it's a person is experiencing homelessness out there, right? Where it's not the person that is the problem. Um, the fact that they don't have a place to live is the problem. And mm -hmm. the fact that um, we as a society are allowing, right, uh, uh, situations where people are living without, a, you know, don't have a place to live. Um, and that if the young people, you know, that I, I work with, if they take that with them constantly, right? And anytime they discuss the issue of homelessness with anyone, if someone makes a comment or whatever, to always proceed with that mentality that first and foremost, it is a person deserving of all of the love, kindness, uh, generosity, hope, support that all people uh, have, you know, should have and deserve. Um, and that if we start from there, um, everything else, you know, uh, I believe can change. Um, uh, but until we, you know, uh, change our focus and stop thinking of the person experiencing homelessness as the problem rather than it is the person who is experiencing a problem. 
Um, it is not permanent. It is not who they are. It does not define them. It is something that they're dealing with and that we are responsible for helping them uh, get through that. That would be where I would start. Thank you. So starting with, with the language, with our own perspectives of how we're seeing and, and discussing issues of homelessness and housing. Um, that's great. Uh, let's see, Shoshana, <laughs> what do you think? What are some ways we can take action? So um, I wrote a couple down. Um, these are ways that I've taken action in my own work. Um, I would encourage, I guess I would encourage everyone to support local nonprofits doing um, this kind of work, Project Home, Federation Housing, um, the Welcome Church. Um, and I would, if, if people are interested in advocacy opportunities, there's a, a nonprofit called the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania that um, ha has a lot of uh, ways in which people can, uh, it's sort of a one-stop shop for news and webinars and uh, advocacy opportunities for um, a f greater affordable housing in the state of Pennsylvania. And I'm happy to share that resource um, and help people sign up for more information there. Um, writing to elected officials and, and um, discussing the need for more affordable housing in the state is another way to do that. And the last thing I would say is that um, trying to fight the not in my backyard mentality. Um, if you hear about affordable housing being developed in your neighborhood, um, coming out and, and supporting it is a good way to do it. When we um, had to go through zoning for our project that we're building in Willow Grove, um, having neighbors there saying that, you know, this isn't bad, this is actually good. Um, it's good for the local businesses, it's good for the people that are gonna be living there. That, um, it, it, it sends a message to everybody. It sends a message to the neighbors who are opposed, it sends a message to the politicians and it ultimately uh, goes a long way to help. Yes, in our backyards, yes. Yes, in my backyard, yes. yes. That's great, thank you. Jackie, what do you think? What are some uh, ways we can all be taking action? Um, well, I kind of agree with the young lady. Um, we we'll have to talk to, uh, um, co to the community, people that live in the community to educate them on um, people that's experiencing homelessness. I like that better than homeless. Um, that way they can get a sense of, because um, experiencing homelessness, people kind of stand away from you. And um, that makes the home, the um, person experiencing homelessness feel some type of way. So um, I think if community will come together and try to communicate with them. You can feel much better about accepting their situation. Mm. Just the way I feel. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Nicole. Uh, it's just, um, what everyone is saying is, is so good. And um, I, I just, I go, I just kind of go back to um, that because it, that hits, that's personal for me, you know, is, is people making a, a living wage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just so important. Um, um, I don't know. You know, it's it's a good thing though to see uh, someone coming off the street and, and how grateful they are that that they can you know that they have hot water and and a door with a key. Um, it's it's um it's really a happy time, and and I'm I'm able to like see that you know regularly and um. I really, I don't know. I just, I just, I think it's, it's just such a, a big issue. And, and it, Martin just said it so well. Um, and I really think it starts with that because uh, just as many people that are, are out there sleeping on the streets. And I think a lot of it 
has to deal with like what Jackie says, like mental illness and addiction and, you know, um, that, that is like, I think, um, addiction, well, I'm sure addiction is a disease, you know, just like cancer or diabetes and, and people don't want to like, they don't aspire to be an addict living on the street, you know, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's really a disease and, and they need the help. Um, and I guess, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's just such a big thing right now. And it's, and it's even compounded with COVID. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, so many people are, are just, you know, they're, they're losing their homes. Mm-hmm. You know? um, I just wish I had more to add. I, mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. And, this, and, and I, I think it's important to, you know, all of you have been, been naming so many sort of intersecting issues and, and challenges from, from COVID, healthcare, um, challenges, having living wage, affordable housing, uh, poverty in the city, so many um, issues, right? Addiction um, layer and mental health support. Um, and uh, I've been thinking about it um, as each one of you is speaking in, in our, our Talmud, the, the wisdom of our rabbis, there's a debate where they start arguing what's better, right? Study um, or action because Torah study, you know, is of great value in, in the religion. So they go back and forth a little bit and then they get to um, this place uh, where they say, you know what, study is great because it leads to action. <laughs> so I think it's, it's a little bit of both. And there's so much learning uh, we all can do about all of these issues and that God willing can help us um, together take, take action in a way to, to shift things, right? One day at a time or in the small ways, you know, um, and larger ways that, that we're able to, to do things. But um, Reverend Chanel, <laughs> do you have any uh, thoughts for us? Yeah, I just um, thought I would highlight a some of the things that the Welcome Church um, is involved in that, again, sort of um, focus on helping to build and maintain and continue relationships with people. Um, and we, you know, are, are so welcoming of anybody who wants to, you know, come alongside of us on any, on any of these kinds of efforts. When people who we know move into housing, we, um, off, or we make an intent to celebrate that new beginning with the gift of a welcome home kit, which looks a whole lot like a, a new housing shower or a wedding shower. People to probably get and look at the things we, we give. We often are able to find a some group of folks who will make who will donate all new sheets and and pots and pans and and things for kitchen, bed, and, and bathroom, so that um, the person you know, has that new beginning celebrated. And then also so that there's really that piece of connection in their lives that they know there's people back on the outside who care about them. I think we've sort of already mentioned that those folks who get a place and for what, you know, for a whole wide range of reasons that doesn't work out. And really part of that is, you know, among all other possible parts is people deal with the, you know, frustration and guilt that there they are inside and they have a whole community of folks they knew who were outside and how, you know, and, and are those ties still there? So we really kind of, at least, you know, for some folks that Welcome Home Kit has helped to, for people to remember that there's ties bigger than their, that their apartment hasn't shut them off of ties. Um, we, uh, in the, when the pandemic began, um, we, well, the Welcome Church was able to start a whole new program called Welcome Bread because for the very reason we're not able to get together with folks anymore. We have um, a bunch of churches um, and folks in different uh, communities making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and also snack bags and also hygiene kits. And we're able to sort of get those into a pipeline to, to get those to people where, they, where they'll be able to do some good to get them directly to people. Also, the Welcome Church has a, a, a women's shelter that we started a number of years ago, which we co-operate with a Bethesda project called The Well. And um, something that folks can do to support The Well is to sign up to bring meals there on, um, on any evening at 7 p.m. We, we have a, a uh, sign-up calendar that would be available for such a thing. And again, just um, helping both the women inside the, the well to build community among themselves and to help um, 
you know, remind people and, and structure us all together as having a bigger community among ourselves. So those are three things that I think that are sort of concrete things that help to underline some of the things I was saying we try to get involved with. Thank you well, so, so much. And um, I uh, see you here. Excuse me, can I, can I just say one thing? Oh, sure, Jackie, yes, of course. Uh, um, excuse me for interrupting, but when she spoke on the, um, the Welcome Church, um, giving a person, uh, what is it, a welcome? She just said, and I don't forget it. Welcome. Anyway, <laughs> I, have, I have experienced that type of help moving into my apartment. And I'm gonna tell you, every time I get ready to use a pot, I always think about how that pot reached the stove or the towel that I use, how did I get that towel? Because it, it, uh, it feels good for someone to help you to move in your brand new apartment and you get brand new stuff and you sleep on brand new sheets that night. So the welcome basket does help a person when they first move into their place. I just wanted to let everybody know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. And um, so I want to, I see um, Joseph's hand. I want to also, Alyssa Balkin um, is here as well. Is going to share a few opportunities um, for, for taking um, action, some different volunteer opportunities that Alyssa has been organizing um, for the BZBI community and others who may be interested. And then I saw um, Joseph's hand for a question and we are gonna open it up for some conversation and questions among everyone who's gathered here in this community tonight. So Alyssa. Sure, hi everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. Um, first, I wanna say thank you to, um, to you Rabbi Annie for um, leading this discussion and also to everybody who shared their stories, um, which I find very moving. Um, and um, as well as all of the amazing work that um, so many of you are doing on the front lines of this issue. Um, right now we're encouraging um, members of the BZBI community to um, engage with us in two opportunities. Um, you can reach both of them through our website um, and through our weekly e-congregation. One is um, purchasing um, items in kind donations through the Amazon list that is comes from the Project Home um, website. Um, so that's the Amazon list that's created by Project Home. We're encouraging people to access that um, to buy items that are needed. Um, and then the second mm -hmm. opportunity right now is um, making lunches um, that we are working on getting delivered um, at least two times a week to um, St. Mary's Church, um, which is also under the umbrella of Bethesda Project, um, where we have cooked some um, dinners in the past as well. Um, I, I think this has been wonderful. I actually have um, some other thoughts of, you know, some other ways that maybe we can get involved. Um, but again, I thank everybody to, um, I can put my um, email in the chat too, if anybody wants to co um, contact me with any questions about these opportunities or just any other ideas for um, you know, some service opportunities for that we can um, help with our congregation for an opportunity to provide the service as well as build awareness on um, the issues of home insecurity uh, right in our Philadelphia community. So thank you all, thanks so much. Thank you so much sure. for your leadership. And um, we're gonna move into questions in just a moment. Um, and I just wanna, uh, before we, we do questions also give uh, mm -hmm. A shout out to um, Rebecca Krasner, who's our community engagement specialist at BZBI, who um, helped, to, helped to organize and launch tonight's um, conversation and our Sukkot Shalom Housing Justice Initiative at BZBI. Um, and, a, and a huge thank you um, to all of our panelists um, this evening, Nicole Still, Reverend Chanel Steinigal, Jackie Chapman, uh, Martin Wiley and Shoshana Bannett. We're just so grateful for your wisdom. We're going to have more conversation and question and answer now, but want to want to thank you right now in case um, others are are transitioning out as we're moving into the the question and answer uh, conversation portion of the evening. Also, a shout out to David Haas, our communications director, for for the technical uh, support um, and getting us set up this evening. And Ivy um, Weingram also for for coordinating. Um, so we we. Uh, 
are grateful to be be in this together. So we're going to have Joseph and then Bella. And if you have a, a question, a few options, you can type something into the chat box. You can physically raise a hand because I am able to see everybody's uh, faces here on the screen, or you can do the raise hand uh, feature. Um, so Joseph Friedman. Um, I wanted to say that um, the homeless situation didn't isn't only drugs and people with special problems. It really, it really developed in my experience in the 60s and 70s and 80s when a lot of cheap housing disappeared. I mean, there used to be uh, single, uh, single room occupancy hotels, right. room houses, boarding houses, whatever you want to call them. All this gradually shut down, you know, over in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, leaving us with you know, the, the housing choices we have today. Uh, but I want to say we're very fortunate, I think, in Philadelphia. Um, I, I contribute to Project Home. I'm familiar with Project Home. Uh, they do have a number that you can call, 215-232-1984. Uh, I'll repeat it, 215-232-1984. You always get an answer. It's uh, my experience. It's always it's always staffed, and if you see people on the street, uh, you can call them and report what you see. Uh, sometimes they've asked me, "Well, have you spoken to the person?" You know, so maybe I'll try to talk to the person if they're not responsive, if they look like they're in difficulty. You can add that on a call, and. Uh, I think it's, a, it's tremendous that we have some place to call because in other cities, I, I've been to other cities where there's, you don't know who to call. You don't know what's going on. Thank you, Joseph. I appreciate that. Uh, Bella. Bella, can you unmute yourself? He can't find you. There you go. There you go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, just a, a couple of things and if, I came in late, so if they were already discussed, I apologize. But I wanted to um, I wanted to mention some legislative advocacy opportunities. Um, there, first of all, Philadelphia really needs to strengthen its tenant protection laws. Um, they are abysmal. So um, the landlord can evict you for any reason, even if you have the money you've broken the lease, they can evict you anyway. They'll take your money, but you're out on the street. So that's one thing. There's also the Affordable Care Act um, allowed for the expansion of Medicaid, which meant that many homeless people were able to access Medicaid. There is a statewide effort. Um, actually, it's a national effort, but um, Pennsylvania Health Access is the organization, and they're working on a project called um, Housing is Health. And the... Mm, I just got kicked out. Oh, well, now we hear you. Okay. Your fixtures froze. Oh, now you're back. Okay. I think I'm back. Um, okay. Um, so there are, so housing is health is um, an effort to attach affordable supportive housing to Medicaid. So if someone does need housing, uh, and I'm not just talking about um, four walls and a space, um, if someone is chronically homeless, um, number one, it, it is a, a byproduct of mental health challenges. Let's not pussyfoot around with that. Um, but so, and these are lifelong challenges. Someone's not gonna get up one morning and say, oh, my health challenge is gone. Um, and so, and what makes Project Home so successful is that that's the kind of housing that they develop is supportive housing that includes case management um, and uh, mental and physical health uh, support. The housing as health um, part of this legislative effort is to pay for the supportive 
piece. Um, and that would enable um, housing developers, low-income housing developers, to tap into um, the funds that would be available for, to pay th for things like case management um, and mental health and physical health support. Right now, organizations have to kind of go sort of patchwork. They go from here to here. Um, and so anyway, this would provide a really good, um, consistent, stable pot of money to pay for the, the things that are needed to house people who have a hard time um, functioning in civic life. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I saw some questions in uh, the chat box as well. So Alyssa Balkin had asked about uh, wanting to hear more about um, how to increase awareness and support for tiny home communities in and around Philadelphia. Um, so the, um, I will take a stab at this and I would, uh, as Jackie is also on the tiny, our sanctuary village board, I would love to hear if she has anything to say. I mean, if, I would love to hear other people's things because we're very interested in this, in this question ourselves. The main thing that comes to mind is, is we, we talked about the nimbyism is if you, I would think, talk to your neighbors and talk to your um, city council person. Uh, to say that if this would th kind of thing would have come up in my if if someone found property in my community and wanted to build hitty, tiny houses on it i would think that would be a good idea and i'm completely in support of it because we I, we have had a couple of times when we have been looking at a property and it hasn't yet come to fruition and obviously each situation is different so i don't but you could lump some of the things that happen among people saying we don't Want that you know certain people who live in that neighborhood saying this isn't something we're comfortable with. So if you are comfortable with it, um, you know, talk to your city council person and your neighbors. Um, we also uh, dream big that we will soon be building tiny houses, and we welcome all support to help us uh, if anybody has a building expertise or any of those kinds of things. We would love to have you on our team. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Are there um, other questions that uh, folks have? Mm -hmm. Beth? I, I guess, um, <laughs> um, yes, for, mm -hmm. um, oops. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, I live in, um, let me try to mute. Oh, mute. Okay. oh okay. <laughs> Um. I live in the 19134 zip code. Um, and some of you might know <laughs> um, sort of um, what the question might tend toward for neighborhoods um, that are experiencing encampments um, and open air drug use um, and some need for intervention that's sensitive um, and both educates the community, but also, you know, tends toward a resolution. I mean. For, for the for the panelists, your organizations, what's the out, a mechanism for outreach? How do you do referrals? Um, you know, what was your experience even coming into the organization? Um, um, because in, in certain areas of the city, it's it's feeling critical right now. So I don't know if anyone can speak toward how um, Project Home and the Welcome Church, et cetera, you know, go out, if, whether you go out to specific areas um, in situations like that. Project Home does have a word turn guide and um, we actually do have uh, active outreach. Um, I'm not real sure on how, what it looks like right now because of COVID, but I know that there are people still actively like literally walking the streets, driving to those areas, um, asking if they want to go in to, um, you know, a shelter, um, if they, you know, want to come in at the time and and that goes back to um some people don't want to come in some people don't they they don't want to um you know and, and we can't force them but we i know project home goes out and offers help regularly 
along with uh, where to turn guides. And anyone can print those where to turn guides if you happen to see someone because they were actually trying to, um, that was like a, a suggestion. That I, I believe the 30 year anniversary we had just a, a year or two ago where uh, we would, instead of giving homeless people crackers, I mean, money, we give them crackers with a where to turn guide around the, you know, as a wrapper. So they could read different places they could go and stuff like that. Um, because I know that that encampment that they had um, or it might still be there over by the art museum, um, Project Home was out there um, all the time, you know, actively trying to support and, and ask people if they wanted to come in and get off the streets and go and take shelter. But you could print them from the Project Home website. Um, you go to Project Home. I, I, I just put it into the uh, chat, actually. Thank you. Um, so it's there in the chat. We also, um, it has the number of our, um, Joseph mentioned this and, and Nicole mentioned this, you know, we have an outreach team that operates 24 seven. Um, there are several teams out at any given time. Um, either they go to certain areas or if they receive a call, they'll go and uh, check with folks and do whatever they can to help uh, folks uh, come in. Like Nicole is saying, sometimes people don't want to come in. I would also say that for a lot of folks, um, they don't trust people. Um, and they don't necessarily trust organizations, um, whether it's nonprofits or the, the people that are most supposed to help and support them um, have many, many times betrayed them or made them feel like a st statistic or like they didn't care. Um, and so a lot of the work that Project Home does is trying to build a relationship with a person. Um, and then once they uh, have that kind of a connection to have that kind of uh, relationship, I have a friend uh, who, who works at our uh, boutique um, a resale boutique who was on the street for uh, over a decade, uh, for decades, and had people coming literally almost every day for years before he finally trusted Project Home folks enough to come in. Um, and now he's, you know, he's got his, you know, education. He he works hard. He's a great uh, guy. Goes speaking around issues of homelessness and all kinds of things like that. Um, to, like, I'm I'm just saying that for a lot of folks, uh, because they don't trust. Um, it's hard to, uh, to have people come in in a way that isn't just putting a roof over their heads, but is truly um, giving them uh, or helping provide them uh, with the things that they need. We, we're Project Home, not Project House, right? Um, because there's a difference between a home and a house, right? A house is just a building that you're in. A home is like where you feel safe and you feel secured and, and, and things like that. And for Project Home, it's, it's an acronym. It's housing, uh, opportunities for employment, medical care, education. Um, and so until someone really has all of, like, access to those things, then they may fall into old habits. Now, that's a lot to say that like, um, there's a lot of work involved in helping someone move from the streets into a permanent place where they feel safe and secured and feel at home. Um, and things like the encampment and, 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 and other uh, actions like that have a certain uh, political element to them, um, which uh, that's their, they're making their choice and they're doing their things. And so I uh, can understand that you may have certain frustrations, uh, et cetera. Totally understand that. Um, at the same time, that's not really, um, it wouldn't really be appropriate for Project Home to go down there and try to get everybody to leave there because they're kind of making a political decision or there are people making political decisions to to be there, if that makes sense. Oh, this is Campbell Square in Port Richmond I was referring to, but yes, I'm aware of both situations. Okay, okay, all right. So there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot going on right now. It's mm -hmm. hard to, to know. Um, but uh, in any, anyway, in answer to your question, that's how Project Home operates, is that we try to build a relationship with individuals um, and then help them get access to the things that they need. Um, until someone is really ready to do that, um, there's not all that much that we can do. I will just uh, give all the uh, congratulations and props to Project Home Outreach. They are, you know, as far as building relationships with people, it's 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 something that they're working on all the time. The outreach workers, and it always sort of, you know, uh, maybe people have gone over this, but we talk about language. You used to hear a lot more like people choose to be homeless or whatever, and it, it a little bit like to me, what does it mean to like you make a we all might make choices, but we also make choices about what we understand among our choices that we understand at any given time. So I think that the part about trust and relationships is big. Like people might be given a 
say, well, why you had somewhere to go? Why didn't you go there? But if it wasn't a choice that they could, were able to make at that time because they didn't, there wasn't the trust there or, or they weren't in a mental state of mind to make one that might seem physically safer, but it just doesn't make sense to them in that way at that time. The word choice just becomes irrelevant in that conversation. And that's why I think building trust and building relationships is so big. I will, the only thing I have to add, I think, is that we, we again, we, we um, are um, major partners in a women's shelter called The Well. And if um, I can put into the chat two uh, numbers, my cell phone number and the number of, of the person who's the case manager for The Well. Um, if, if anybody sees a woman out on the streets who you know, who's, who and any kind of conversation develops that the person would be, you know, would be interested in somewhere to stay, we can take referrals for the well right now. So I want to make, I I'm happy to share um, my number and the number for the well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move us toward closing this evening conversation in the hopes that it is a beginning to continued conversations and partnership um, and study and action um, in the BZBI community. And um, we can follow up and share um, some of these incredible resources and opportunities and, and ways folks can continue to stay engaged um, in this, this big it's about this commandment of, of um, ensuring that people have shelter. Um, I just want to close us back out with the song that started from uh, this song for the evening, a prayer for peace um, in the night, for safety, for protection, for shelter. Um, on this night, one, one night at a time, and um, God willing, may we, we create together a world that where there is space for all, where all can, can feel at home. Um, so the words again, spread over us, a shelter of peace, a shelter of wholeness. so much for being here. Thank you again, Nicole and Reverend Chanel, Shoshana, Martin, Jackie, for, okay. for sharing your, your story, your teaching, your wisdom uh, with us. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for including me in the panels. Really.